Um, so I was working at the Chicago Tribune back when newspapers mattered. And um, news, uh, news, sorry, Hillary. News, uh, what was this word? News, yeah, news newspaper. Product? It was this big thing that came in a broadsheet, and people read it in the oh. morning. Yeah, I heard they had columns. They did. They had columns. But how so, would you, you tap and zoom this, or whatever? This, this gets even better. This gets even better, and it's it's no mystery why newspapers uh, had such a had such a fall, but. So the wise men at the Chicago Tribune decided that they needed a special section of the newspaper for women, and they were going to call it Women News because, you know, women might not read the rest of the paper. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be pink. Right? Like recipes. Right? It, was like, it was like fashion and recipes. and No, it was, it was a terrible idea, and I think it lasted about six months. Anyway... Um, James Roll came out of that because I was working at the trip at the time, and they were like, "Oh, we should do a comic too, you know, a comic by a woman for women." But of what, course, and what year was this? <laughs> this was '91. Because that's when I got to Chicago, and really? I remember "woman news" was all one word. Yeah, yeah. "woman yeah. news" and like "woman with one color" and "yes." The, other. Oh. the horror. It was so cutting edge. Yeah, it was awful. So <laughs> it would have been cutting news maybe in like 1972. Right. I don't know, but it was '91. What, co- what color were the women in news? Was like blue and something. Yeah, yeah, they would change it, I think. <laughs> anyway, they didn't the comic didn't didn't work for them because it wasn't gender specific enough. <laughs> because it didn't talk about, you know, finding the right bathing suit or mm-hmm. dieting or kids or whatever. So <laughs> But something about the comic I liked. I kept drawing it in my sketchbook, and I kept, like, drawing Jane. Basically. It was basically Jane and her friends, yeah. and, you know, all around Chicago. Was it called Jane's World then? No, it was called Sea Jane. Sea like, Jane? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. like Sea Dick, Sea Spots, mm, yeah. Jane. Yeah, clever. Not really. <laughs> anyway, then, I, then I, I thought it was so clever. So then I moved to Atlanta, and I'm working for the paper there, and I thought, you know, I'm going to repitch this because maybe, like, wow, it's like it's a few years later. Maybe we've grown. And you've kind of learned a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I've learned a little bit more. It. So basically this editor kind of said the same thing. It wasn't gender specific enough, and I was like, you know, that just pisses me off. Like it, Like a woman can't just do a comic that's just funny. Like, you, on the comics page of the newspaper, you got like a million comics by all these guys that are basically, they can do anything, any subject matter. But if a woman does a comic, it's got to be, and I'm sure you've dealt with this challenge, it's got to be certain criteria. So I was like, well, screw Can you think that. of any specific feedback they gave you? Because I'm trying to imagine. It was parenting, did, mother, did they, did motherhood. They, so like, they just said, oh, it has to be this? Yeah, it has to be like, there's nothing about motherhood. There's nothing about children. Did they there's nothing wanna... about their husband. There's nothing. I mean, I'm talking like. You would have thought it was June Cleaver. It was like 1994 or something. I was like, Did they, do, were they trying to like differentiate it and give it kind of a gimmick? Or what's women's comics? Not probably, okay. but give me a break. Yeah, That's I mean, like no, the no. worst way to do. Anytime you try to fill a niche with a yeah. creative venture, you're going to fail because yeah. it's not going to feel authentic. Yeah. I mean, it's just not. So anyway, like forced, right? Yeah, it's yeah. gonna feel like you're forced. So anyway, that was the birth of Jane's World. So I was working in the newspaper full time, and I would go home at night and watch Silk Stockings on TV <laughs> and eat like Captain Crunch and like draw Jane's World and then post it on the internet. And that's kind of how it started. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I don't know. It just kept growing and growing and growing and growing, and I got more so invested were, in it. I think. So you were. Um, I didn't take it very seriously online. in the were beginning. You, were though. you were syndicated yet or not? No, it, that didn't happen until I ended up taking this job with uh, Charles Schultz back in, like, 99. Mm-hmm. And um, I had been in contact with his editor, and I don't know, at some point they just decided they liked it. And so they started publishing online. So, so it started with an online syndication probably in 99, mm-hmm. 2000 maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, and when did you start to do collections of publishing yourself? Not too long after that, like 2001, 2002, mm-hmm. yeah. That's when... I started with floppies, yeah, which yeah. I really miss, right. like 24-page comics. Mm-hmm. So you basically would collect a month's worth of comics into a 24-page book, and then you'd collect that into a trade paperback, mm-hmm. which actually would end up getting into bookstores, which is where you would make your real money. You don't make much on the 24-page comics because mm-hmm. the only people that buy those are comic shops. And now, and same as with newspapers, there's, there's kind of fewer of those, right. too. So, but what you find if you're trying to have a full-time job and do this other comic, like a monthly comic is a really hard, hard schedule to keep. And then the distribution, which you probably discovered, is a total other headache you're not prepared to deal with. So so there's one huge distributor that works with comic bookshops. And at some point, halfway through my sort of publishing 
career, they decided to raise the benchmark for uh, for orders. For orders. Yeah. So you'd have to meet a certain benchmark based on price point. I'll try to keep this numbers thing to a limited. I know, it so like a dollar threshold. They yeah, there was like a money, money threshold. So then what ends up happening if you're a small publisher and say you're only publishing 3,000 books or whatever, you need to be publishing a book that has a higher price point. So that sort of ended the James World floppies, right. and I just started doing trades. It's not a bad thing, actually, because... For you, you're doing you're doing less of the dealing with the printer and the distributor. You're only doing that like once every six months or nine months or something. And then you have this book to show for it. So it wasn't necessarily a bad trend. It wasn't, right. it wasn't a bad thing. It just kind of naturally happened. Yeah. I kind of wish, though, when I look back at mine, that I'd had like an editor who had said, don't even publish the first like six floppies because um, I was just figuring it all out you yeah. know it's I guess every artist but you, feels that way but you kind of I, I, like this one truism that I always bring up is hopefully you do your worst work first right <laughs> and so you make all your mistakes like you, you can't bypass it like you no. have to you have to make all those decisions and people bought them people love them people have them they I, I have think they're them. endearingly messy and mm -hmm. confused and I'm, I'm like I think because it's so early I can't remember <laughs> The guy who ran the Gay Comics Town forever? Uh, Andy. Andy, Andy Mangles. Andy Mangles. So he also did Gay Comics for a while. So he got the first few issues. And, you know, you think at the time it's tough to have somebody give you really constructive feedback. But I was doing this thing where I was piecing together uh, stuff from the online the online publication, right? But with that wasn't daily. That was like three days a week. So I would try to bridge the gap with like a a paragraph of text or something and he like he he sent me a note he said don't do that that's crap don't do oh that. yes yes the mixing of the, yeah and the i was like i was like, like and then this all this stuff happened in this big paragraph he's like no don't do that that's all <laughs> that's terrible and i was uh, like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so anyway i was like you know but somebody needs to tell you that and yeah you, and then you need to, stop you need to doing do it so that they can yeah, say don't do to, that yeah so yeah. if if somebody you respect gives you is brave enough to give you possibly hurtful <laughs> constructive criticism Un Note. Yes, yeah, you need to listen to that. See, I probably went. You know, you might want to think. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was great. He was yeah. like, no, don't do that. That's awful. And yeah. I was like, oh, okay. Sometimes that is like the best thing about you know just a brutal like. Yeah, yeah. Blast. It's like ripping the bandaid off. Yeah. I knew it was bad. I just needed somebody to call me on it. I don't yeah. know. Well, so you did the floppies. You started doing the collections, um, and then, but then there's other projects. There's. Like the Martian, you publishing oh, yeah. the Martian, Martian Confederacy. Confederacy. <clears throat> I always had this big vision that uh, the the little company I formed, Girl Toy Comics, would turn into this bigger thing, and I'd publish more comics Other by people. women. But it never really happened, just mm. because of time. Yeah. Because I ended up getting this job in California that I really loved, and I ended up getting more and more involved in that, and that just took tons of mental energy. Yeah. So. And only being one person is such a. It's, it's a limiting, right. yeah, it's a limiting factor. <laughs> yeah. 24 hours in the day is also a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam, yeah, Sam, I've often thought there should be two of you as well. Uh, you, you know, really need hey, I mean, if only for my, my nighttime activity. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> kind of fun. But um, I was anyway. Gonna, I was going to say, though, I was going to say, though, you know, I, I still think uh, publishing online is a great, even though I did it a million years ago and it took a while for it to manifest okay. into print, yeah. yeah. I still think it's a really great way to get your work noticed because I had started doing this, um, this just happened last year, that everything I was doing was so deadline oriented and so like pressure and intense and my job's gotten really crazy at, at the Schultz studio and I thought, you know what, I just want to go old school. I want to do a cartoon just because I like to draw cartoons and I'm not going to try to sell it and I'm not going to try to say anything special or do any, you know, it's not going to be an inch. And it was about all these frogs living on this pond, mm -hmm. and I called it Apocalypse Pond because the environment's going to shit, and frogs are, like, on the front line of it all, right? <laughs> and I was publishing on this website called Tapastic, which, mm -hmm. if you want to self-publish, has a really great interface for uploading comics. Tapastic? Tapastic, Tapastic. yeah. Like tap a yeah. So I'm doing that thinking this is not going to turn into anything and it gets picked up by this publisher in Kansas City and it's of course we had to change the name because Apocalypse was a little too dark for yes. third graders apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Plus who can spell it when you're trying to search it? I always had to do a spell check. Anyway, <laughs> it's now called Stinky Cecil and it actually ended up getting turned into a book within like just a few months of publishing online. So it can happen. Yeah, and you're publishing that? 
Th this is being published by a publisher in Kansas City. Okay. Uh, yeah, Andrews and Mill. They do kids. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I have all these gay comics, and then I have this comic about toads that's for kids. <laughs> <laughs> they have nothing to do with each other. Just follow your bliss. Yeah, follow your bliss. <laughs> um, and then I guess uh, for me, it was, it was just a matter of... Uh, um, I was working, uh, volunteering with PRISM and doing a lot of work with them. Uh, and I, actually, I'll recommend anybody who's getting started in, uh, has dreams of publishing their own work or being published, the, one of the best things you can do is to find uh, community organizations uh, like CBLDF or uh, Geeks Out or PRISM Comics. Um, find those organizations, volunteer with them, uh, help them because they're working with creators that you love, and you'll get to be running errands for them, talking with them, uh, watching them do their stuff, uh, seeing how to negotiate all the business side of it and the convention part of it and all that stuff. Like you'll get a little uh, window into all that, and you learn incredible amounts learn of stuff. You learn a lot. Yeah, and so um, my education in the comics industry was working with Prism from 2003 till the end of time. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, you know, I kind of got, I got a feel for how to do conventions, I got a feel for how to organize anthologies and, uh, and events and panels and um, stuff like that. And then um, one of the other people who was volunteering was John Macy, uh, who had done some work in the, in the 90s with kind of very dark and <coughs> twisted gay comics uh, for Eros Comics. Um, and he was working on this uh, adaptation of a Victorian novel, uh, Telony, which was attributed to Oscar Wilde and his circle of, uh, of, of friends uh, and writers in, the, in, the, in London. And so he was adapting this. He'd been looking at it for years and years and years and years. And he started sending me um, pages, and I would kind of give him advice, and I would help him with like, the technical stuff and lettering and uh, software and all that stuff. And then when it finally came time for him to publish it, he did a self-publishing run of it. He wanted to do 200, because that's how many edition, how many copies there were of the original book. But he did 100 uh, self-published books in the spring of 2010. And then uh, I was at whatever show I was at, maybe WonderCon or something like that, and I got a copy of it. And, uh, and it, it's, it's, a, it's hard to describe without being disparaging. I don't want to be disparaging of it, because it's that feeling you get when you see that somebody has done something and you know that they're a genius, and you know that they're so talented and so smart and such a great artist, um, but you know that they're not a marketer and they're not a designer and they're not all these other things, and you know that you can help. And you just like, oh, oh I can help them be more, like everyone knows that they're a genius, mm -hmm. like if I help them. And so I, um, I, I immediately saw it, that he had done it like a, a, like a comic, so he had like a big color comic, like a, a illustration of the two of them couple from the novel, it's a love story, um, on the cover, and it just looked like a comic book trade, and it didn't, it didn't convey the literariness of it, it didn't convey the, the weight and the importance of it, um, and I was worried that it would, it would kind of disappear, and he'd been working on this for eight years, and so I'm like, this is just a tragedy. So um, I started talking to him and Justin Hall, and I would say they kind of bullied me into it, but they got me to publish um, Telony, and then also Justin's book, Glamazonia, which is a collection of his Amazonia comic strips that he'd been doing in anthologies. And uh, it was basically because I was totally selfish. I, I wanted to see these books produced. I wanted to see them produced really well. I had this background in advertising and marketing, and so I knew about print production and about all the specs and all the things that, um, um, that artists don't often care about <laughs> or, afraid um, or, or afraid of. or you know. Um, so I had first, first thing I had John do was rescan all of his originals and because I could see all the jaggy lines. Like he'd scanned them all grayscale, and so then he printed them at 300 DPI, and so you could see all the kind of the ghostly images. And there was all black and white, there was no, sh no shades of gray, so it didn't need to be done like that. It should have been done differently. So we just kind of started from scratch and polished it and, and relettered it and did all the work on it, um, and then published it with this cover with this kind of gold ink on it and like a faux leather thing. Tried to make it like really like, this is an important book that you must read. Um, and so it won a, it got nominated for and won a Land of Literary Award that year. It was kind of by Welcome to Publishing, Keep Doing It kind of award. Um, and that was kind of the beginning of it. I just kept doing it. I had a day job at the time. I could throw money, and I did throw money at this venture. Uh, and I just kept publishing books uh, and going into debt. 
And then uh, I had a business plan. It was my birthday present to myself that year. And so my birthday, my birthday is the Express's birthday. Um, and I just learned a lot. I, I mean, I don't think any of us, uh, like Dennis was saying, like you, you didn't have any idea that you were going to be a publisher. You didn't go to school for it. You didn't um, have a set of publishing skills that you just needed to put to good use. We all had to learn everything that we did. Um, and I think that that's, um, people kind of wonder, like, well, how did you, like, what, how did you learn all this? And like, well, I learned it because I had to, because I had to do it. I mean, it had to get done. Do you think that's a good thing? Do you think it's a good thing to just learn as you go? Or do, would you, well, do you have regrets about having to do that? Would you, would you have liked to have had like this whole professional? Well, I think that's what these are for. Yeah. I mean, that's they, why they, we're well, here, they right? say, yeah. uh, they say bliss is ignorance. And in my case, uh, I, I would say, yes, if, if anyone had explained to me what publishing was, it might have been kind of scary. I would have, I would have run from it. Too. Yeah. <laughs> but when it's a day at a time and you solve a problem and then you have another problem and you solve it, you gain self-confidence. And uh, I was lucky at the time I was starting, the, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a kind of a publisher's dream in the sense that the, uh, the demand exceeded the supply. There was this uh, youth movement, the uh, hippie movement, whatever you want to call it back then, was seeking its own literature. We had underground newspapers in major cities and college towns, but but aside from that, comics, underground comics, were the only unifying thing, and comics more so because they spanned the whole country, whereas underground papers were regional. So uh, because comics were popular and people loved to get stoned and read them, uh, <laughs> head shops were the natural conduit. So I was lucky in the sense I didn't have to deal with Diamond, right. thank God. <laughs> and uh, we created our own system. And uh, What was your distribution network? What was that? It was uh, primarily uh, head shops. I mean, they were just buy directly? Yeah. And, uh, and again, when I started... No one told me you should probably run credit checks on retailers. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was the honor system, it was the golden rule, right? You like, you know, but I have to tell you, again, this comes from naivete, but there was a sense of uh, camaraderie, and it was about two years into it before we actually got burned by someone, and, and the first time we were, I was, I was mortified. It's like, how can they not pay the bill? Mm -hmm. Because they uh, were part of a movement, and uh, I mean, you, know, you guys understand that. There is a sense of we're in this together. Yeah. So I say lucky because those aren't things you would face today. I mean, if you were starting a publishing company today, yeah, definitely run a credit check. But back then, I didn't have to. But I think that um, I think our philosophies are quite similar in the way I'm doing it because I um, I'll do things like like I, I got an order uh, for uh, Queer, the book that Rob did, uh, in hardcover from Reed College. They ordered five copies of it, uh, full price on the website. And so um, I went into PayPal and I refunded half the money because I give a discount to libraries. And I'm, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not rich. Like, I don't have the money to do this, but, but I know that that's, that's what I should do. Like, I mean, if, if they Kathy Camper that she's a librarian. Like, if they didn't know that, that, they should have known it. And so I refunded the money. And then, and then they did a chargeback on the whole charge because they'd used the wrong credit card or something. And I'm like, don't do that, don't do that. Um, but we figured it out. But um, basically, they, I already sent the books. They got the money refunded to them, all of it. And I'm like, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure they'll pay me again. Like, I, I wasn't worried about it because ultimately I would rather trust the world and enjoy that feeling of like trusting people most of the time. Um, and get disappointed once in a while because that way I can enjoy 95, 98% of my life being trustworthy and, and trusting people and being happy and then occasionally get disappointed. Yeah. I would much rather do it that way. Yeah, when I was doing zines, like somebody would every now and then some lovely soul would send me a, a check written out to strange looking exile or boy trouble and I would just send them the zines and uh -huh. the check back and say just, and I, they always sent the money, you know, yeah. like, what, when I'm gonna like fuss over four or five bucks, yeah. I just, you know, get, I want the work out there and, and yeah, it just, you do do stuff with little love and trust and it, it comes back to you. People I really respond to that. It. Yeah, like, they do. You give them a little extra, like um, yeah. a lot of times, I don't know if you've ordered it, if you've ordered a Northwest Press book, uh, you might've been happily surprised to get a tote bag with your book. Like your book is wrapped up in a little tote bag. 
because I give those away at shows and I want to have something when they open the box, like I think probably my marketing background, I used to work for a major phone company and um, <laughs> they, uh, one? one of the things they were obsessed with was, was unboxing. They wanted to have like, you get your new phone and you unbox it and you have this whole experience. <laughs> and it, it, it's, um, it was always hard for them to justify it to the higher up people because they're like, they already bought it. Like they, you already got them, a, they've signed a contract and they already bought it. You don't have to do any of this because they, they're stuck with you. I'm like, that's not the phrase you want to use with people that you want to be loyal to you. That's why everybody hates phone companies, by the way, because the people who say that kind of stuff are in charge. Um, but uh, I want people to have that feeling of opening up and feeling like, like being really happy that they paid the money, that they supported these artists. Presentation yeah. is yeah. so important. It really is. Yeah. I love giving little extras. Yeah, when so like little stickers or yeah, whatever. Yeah, anything, yeah. 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 Do you have any questions yet? Uh, uh, sure. Yes. I have a question. Since yeah. you're all self-publishers, and I would be curious among the four of you, kind of your state of the state in terms of where you sell your work. Like 40% of it, it, it is online, 30% is on shows. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's so different. Yeah, it's coming up. We'll, we'll okay, get I read your cell phone. So. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I do want to talk a little bit about. Um, I want to get to the digital stuff, I want to get to the distribution stuff, the kind of the reaching niche audiences and all of that kind of thing. The sexy stuff. The sexy stuff. Um, but I do want to ask, one of the questions that uh, I was talking with John Macy about this, and one of the questions he suggested I ask was, um, what are some of the um, important business relationships when you're a publisher, um, a diamond or a distributor, um, bookstores, press and reviewers, um, community kind of like tastemakers and advocates for your work like who are who are the people who when you think about it's successful because I have that person or those people who are some people that come to mind when you think about that well, um, sure yeah. Yeah. well theoretically the distributor but I find the distributors are probably the most soulless and mm -hmm. people, at, people at the top are out of touch and the ones underneath are just doing their job and they're really enthusiastic. I find that the best people to network with is the retailers starting with the most enthusiastic ones because they're the ones actually placing the orders, the ones actually placing it on the shelves and you want nice placement and you want people who actually behind the counter are making recommendations. So when that fan comes in and they connect with, you know, usually why are they buying in a comic shop in the first place instead of buying it online at a cheaper price? Is they want the connection. They want to be able to talk about comics. Or somebody. maybe they didn't know what they wanted and wanted exactly. a recommendation. And so once the retailer has the trust of that customer, then they can make recommendations. They can say, oh, you like A, try B, right over there. So because I was a relatively small publisher, you know, competing against people like DC and Marvel and those who dominate the stands, I needed to know that I had a section of that store. And if I had a relationship with the, just even a few dozen really good retailers, they disproportionately represented my base because of the, at the time there were somewhere close to 3,000 retail stores in North America. I figured about 10% were actually carrying kitchen sink product. That was a sad reality. Mm -hmm. But, but those 10% were... Those were great. great. Yeah. And those were people, they could, they could sell 100 of a title in their own store mm -hmm. uh, because they carried and they give a good placement. So I'd say to the degree you can meet them at trade shows and so on, those are, those are very important. And the second is, you mentioned uh, reviewers, is to make sure not just the main reviewers, but people who are blogging. And you know, if you can get them PDFs, you don't have to send everybody a print copy, but but send everybody who will chat about it. Even if only 17 people read their blog, those could be 17 critical people. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and and mostly it's just uh, making yourself available too. Don't dodge calls, uh, don't dodge emails. Work 24 seven if you have to, because it's all about relationships mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, it's true. Like the, the network, get, get on the network. Um, I, I, I get frustrated with a lot of cartoonists. Like I most telling them, get you know, really. It takes a long time, but just get a Tumblr, get on Twitter, just mm -hmm. do it. You know, I know, even if you don't want to do it, just just do it. And 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 if and I guess like if you really don't want to do it, then don't do it because there's nothing sadder 
than this little Twitter account sitting there with two tweets you know, from like two years ago. Uh-huh. Or, you know, uh, yeah, my advice is if you don't have a website or so, if you have anything in the web, contribute to it, make, keep it alive. I have a promise to myself I will blog on my my own website once a month. You know, I will, I will absolutely, even if I have nothing to say, I will. You'll say, I'm nothing to say this month and you'll just yeah. ramble for a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I always do. I always have, you know, here's a link to a review, review I just did. Here's, you know, this is the event I'm going to, blah, blah, blah. Just, um, and just work your, and, and cherish your fans, the people that they're the ones that, that you do it for. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, get a get a uh, list of everybody who any any anybody who has ever ordered from you. Get a list and keep that list and email list. Tell them when you know you've got a new thing coming out. Which I, reminding myself, I have to do that. <laughs> um, yeah, it just I don't really work. I mean, when I remember when I did the the curbside book, the the one with the Zurich grant, I did Diamond did take it. Um, I they took like. A certain amount, and they paid me. You know, I got uh, I think I had like a thousand dollars, nine hundred bucks from them or something. They took like I can't remember how many it was, but I remember the book retailed for eight dollars, which is kind of a lot back then. You know, it was like in the late nineties. Um, but then they tried to upsell me. They said, well, you know, if you took out a big trade ad in here, we would, <laughs> we would take more of them for you. Which I ran the numbers. Yeah, that's not going to happen. I just cut my losses. Yeah, and I just kind of did it again through the network. And now I feel like there's a fairly good network with the internet, you know, that thing that came along that we all are on now. And there's a good, there's, there's reviewers out there and you should send your work out for review. Um, you can often, and, and you should ask people to, uh, if they're willing to review it, uh, do you want a PDF or a hard, like if for, I told Zan, like I'll review Northwest Press, things like, like a, a floppy, just send me the PDF, but a, a graphic novel. I, I cannot read a graphic novel on on, on a PDF. It's just it's, it feels like work to me. Whereas like a short thing is is fine. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Just use every angle and just don't give up. Just keep going. You know. So Paige, who are the who are the important roles or people that stand out in your publishing stuff? Well, I was going to say the same thing Dennis did as um, retailers, comic book retailers, because there's a, there are a handful of them that are very vocal and people listen to their recommendations even when they, you know, put post things on their websites and things like that, even if people don't frequent, frequent their stores. Um, oh, who are some of them? Joe Ferrara is a really mm-hmm. great one, uh, if you know Which him. Store is he? he <laughs> he's in Santa Cruz, mm-hmm. but he mm-hmm. runs the retailer, usually the retailer category of the Eisner's right. thing. So, I mean, mm-hmm. he's like ta- getting on his Radar is like getting on everybody's radar. He's he's really great, and he just loves comics. Super nice. So he's more of a gateway to retailers than um, yeah than a single store that you would. But he also just knows everybody. Like I walked the floor with him at Comic Con a couple couple times, and he'll just introduce you to everybody. He's super he's super friendly. Um, and then like comic book resources, if you can get them to review your book, um, there's some kind of key websites that are are great, and um, you really. I mean, I have a really hard time now doing shows because I'm just kind of, uh, I just, I don't know if I'm just burnt out or my introvertness is like rising to the surface or something. But the best thing you can do is be at shows and be at some of the good ones. Yeah, be at the like Baltimore show, um, the Small Press Expo. That the the other really great entry point used to be the Alternative Press Expo in San Francisco, but that is not happening. It is happening. Is it happening? Uh, But it's moving. The uh, Dan Vado. I guess re is it Dan Bottle, right? Re, re, is he moving, reclaimed yeah, it. Yeah, is he moving again? So they moved to San Jose. Okay. So that's a really good one. That if you do Baltimore and that one, then you've tapped like both sides of the country. Like you've hit audiences on the East Coast and the West Coast, which mm-hmm. I did when I was first starting out. Mm-hmm. And um and then the Emerald City show in uh, Seattle now, is really good. Do you have trouble getting it? The one thing that's becoming an increasing problem, um Stephen Bissett just uh posted something on Facebook. Um, a, a, about a month ago, and he was, he's getting really concerned about how many people are getting rejected. You know, I mean, their demand is becoming so strong. There's, you know, I mean, you, you don't get into some shows. Well, right? so we, uh, I came late, ironically, even though I was born in Bethesda, where Small Prince Expo yeah. happens. Uh, and I Sorry, yeah, I'm there. in Bethesda, not Baltimore. Right. Um, I, uh, 
See. I didn't go to SPX as an exhibitor until uh, maybe about five years ago. Like that. I think it was 2013, right? Yeah. It was later. It was earlier than that because oh, I did okay. it once and I did it again the next year. But then the next year, the, the lottery happened. Oh yeah. And I didn't get in, yeah. and then I didn't get in, and then I didn't. You know, so I haven't been the back. Even I thought maybe getting an Ignatz Award would would have them like scoot me in somewhere, but no, they didn't yeah. do it. But I, but Dylan and I are going to represent. Oh, good. The press press. Oh, good. Well, let me know if you need any books. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think we'll need some. Oh, good. Now. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> so I have a question about um, store relationships because you won't, you don't know it to look at me, but I am a learned extrovert. <laughs> Uh, and I have phobias about like calling people. I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to call people unless they know I'm going to call, unless they want me to call. I start, start with back. email. Well, yes. So I do email too. But then everybody emails. Everybody gets so many emails that I worry that I'm not. I'm not actually not able to get through to somebody and make a relationship. It's not about like giving information to somebody because I do that and I have a list and I have a. Retailers are on my new copy, like new review copy list, and they get digital copies and they get news about what's going on. But in terms of building a relationship with the store, um, do you have any advice on like when to contact people? It's kind of like they tell you uh, if you're if they're if you're a public person trying to approach a publisher, you very rarely approach them at a convention because they're so busy doing everything and they, they don't have the time or the headspace to devote to you necessarily. But you can make a introduction and say, I'll get in contact with you next month or something like that and just kind of get that started as an introduction, not as a meeting. Do you have any yeah. advice on how to do, uh, how to build those relationships with, with stores? Well, again, it, it varies. I know <clears throat> one of the things I tried to do when I was traveling, I might be going to on a business trip that was unrelated to the comics industry, but if I was in such and such a city and I knew there was a retailer or two, I would try to at least go by the store, visit. even if it was a five or ten minute trip, to say hello and say I was in town, thought I'd come in, wanted to see your shop. They're so flattered sometimes that someone just wants to actually see their shop, because that's their world and they want to show it off. And then at the same time, you know, if I can either say, hey, I'm really glad to see you're carrying that, or hey, you've Freaking liar! You told me you're carrying my stuff. I don't see it anywhere. But, 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 Gentle but, so, Yeah. No. But, but seriously, just to pay attention. Yeah. And uh, again, email is a great way to just uh, you know you can do instead of a blast to everybody, you can personalize it. You can have the essence of something, but you can it's dear Bob, dear Joe, dear. That's what I Andrea. always do. Yeah. yeah. I always go to the website, I find out who the main person Personal is, type. and I address the, the email to them. I don't do yeah, don't do mass email. Nobody wants that. Did, and Dennis, did you bring it's when you would go to the <laughs> satchel comics and when you would scope out the scores and have them available in case they were interested? Well, to here's some sample. Copies? Possibly, possibly, but it, it's just, it's trying to personalize as much as you can. I used to use postcards a lot for promotion, and again, I would have a mailing list, but the ones I knew, I would scribble a line in the postcard. Hey, Joe, you know, whatever, just a line. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the postcard, oh, Dennis took the time to say hi. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of a thing. For the minute it takes to do it. I think it pays dividends. Okay. Uh, and you can extrapolate that in any way you want. Uh, uh, if you're a self-publisher, you have a limited budget, obviously. You may not even be able to afford a postcard campaign. But I would say start building up a mailing list. Uh, if you don't know any retailers, I know Comics Journal used to have a double-page spread, like a dozen, maybe a couple of dozen retailers across the country banded together to take out an ad. I forget what they call themselves. But right there, there's two dozen addresses to start with. And then it's talking to people, like who's good in San Francisco, who's good in New York. You get those names, addresses, start milking them. If you can't sell your books, give them away. Mail them with a cover letter that says, hey, here's my book. Uh, you know, maybe you didn't see it in the diamond catalog, but I hope you carry it. You can order it direct. I'll give you 50% off. I'll pay the postage. Things like that. Yeah. Another thing uh, um, in terms of important contacts is... Um, committees that give out awards because it's a it's a, a, a well-kept secret that in order to get an award you have to nominate a book for an award <laughs> and submit it for consideration um, and so what? I know <laughs> uh, so I think you know one of the jobs that I have as a publisher is 
Um, the books have to go to uh, the Rainbow Book Award. They have to go to Isers. They have to go to Landa's. Um, just because that's their only chance of, of getting the nod. You, know. you, you, know have, to pay, you, you have, have to pay money for that, too. I have to pay money. Yeah, I don't 20. want the artist to pay any yeah. money. You know what I learned recently about the Eisners, too, um, is yeah. that the way they, the way they, maybe you guys already know this, but the way they dole the books out, uh, somebody has to actually request the books, the person on uh, the review committee. Oh, really? So a retailer that I'm good friends with, who was a judge in the last couple of years, said, you need to do something really cool on your cover letter, because that's what they're seeing first. And I was like, oh. Yeah. So this year I did like this full color cool. cover letter. <laughs> I'll do one of those like fortune teller things. <laughs> like, N W P. Do, do um, you all do you all know how the uh, the Ignatz awards were? No. Um, yeah, I, I was on the jury in two thousand nine, and basically they you know like you are nominated by the people. Like when you're done, you nominate two other people, uh -huh. and then to be just, judges. Yeah, okay. to be jurors, you know, and basically you get a shit ton of books in like in late like in June, I think May and June, and you try desperately to, to read as much as possible. I mean, you get, I mean, I've heard it's even worse now mm -hmm. than when I did it. But I remember I had, a, but it was a wonderful education. You And at the end, you know, you have all these new people that you adore and all these creators that are amazing that you have discovered through doing this. But it's it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 you just pick you know they have a you know you pick for all the categories one two three you know and and you pretty much you know like if you're something is your number one it will pretty much be nominated mm -hmm. you know so it's power yeah yeah and then it just passes on yeah. um, so I do want to get to um, some of the specifics and breakdown of of media like what format a book is going to go out in. Uh, is it going to be an offset book? Is it going to be a print-on-demand book? Is it going to be a, a, a zine, a very homegrown thing? Uh, a digital edition? And what kind of a percentage of um, maybe a specific title, like how many digital versus how many print do you sell? And then in terms of the whole catalog of books that you're working on, um, do some books only get digital? Do some books get print? Um, you know, what kind of mix do you do? And uh, do you see trends emerging in those? Age. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't. I don't do digital releases. Well, I mean, I. I know. I tried yeah. for a while. You and I did one. Yeah. I have... was doing the monthlies as digitals, mm -hmm. thinking rather than print the monthlies, if right. somebody wanted to let a lower, you know, right, you know, spend less money. But do you have any numbers on how that did? Uh, it wasn't a lot, and it's just so much uh, to keep track of that. Mm -hmm. That's what I had a hard time with. Yeah. Um. Do you do, so you do um, so you do print? Yeah. And your print is is it all offset? Do you do like a print run and then warehouse them, or do you? Yeah, do I was gonna say don't print. Maybe you would say this differently, but for me, don't print hardcover. I thought when I did the tenth volume, James, what I thought it's ten volumes. This is an anniversary. I'm gonna do a hardcover book. That was so stupid. Why? <laughs> Why was that stupid? They page? weigh a ton. So <laughs> I don't know how many suitcases I like broke trying to haul books to shows. You know I what I mean? And you don't make any money myself. on postage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you charge more, right? Oh God! Well, I I should have run the numbers better. And then I thought, don't don't do this either. But this, <laughs> this is just me. You got to do all the wrong things one time, and yes. then you can yeah. say, okay, never. So you know never why again. never to do them? Yeah, I um, had seen a book at uh, Stumptown that I really liked mm -hmm. the production value on, and so I found out where the guy had printed it because it was a small. It was a small press anthology, but it looked so good. And I thought, oh, that's what I'm going to do for book 10. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a publisher in Seattle, but they print in China. So, huh? I know who it is. Yes. Yeah. So, oh my God. That I whispered takes, that in case there's going to be really that takes the coming. whole <laughs> That takes all the business part up to a whole new level because you got to wire money. you got to work with a printer in Hong Kong. You've got, you've got this interface in Seattle. And yeah, you're getting the book a lot cheaper, but by that time they put it on a boat and ship it and it takes, you know, eight weeks to get here. I'm just not sure. I was like, okay. And it's full of the tears of um, slave well, children. Then they, yeah, and then they show up at your they show up at your office. I may be exaggerating. No, I mean they show up at your office on a platform and you got like this big shrink wrap platform of books and you're like, what the fuck? I don't know. What am I gonna do with 
And then you got to get all your friends to help oh. you carry them inside because nobody told you that you have to say up front you actually want the books in the house. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I know. They don't bring them inside. So they don't. learn from my mistakes. Yes. Do not do that. You can email me and I'll remind you not to do that. <laughs> um, so then I went back to working with uh, Brenda in Texas. Let's see who I print with and they do offset. Mm. And I actually, I almost hesitate to bring this up. But for people who are really just starting out, it is a, it is a viable option to get small print runs to take to shows, and that's um, to do like Amazon, a print on demand. Thing. Amazon's print on demand interface. Okay. Is that good? Yeah, I actually printed a book there as sort of an experiment, and um, so basically, you can print a book. What is it called? Why can't I think of the name like of it? Like a digital. If you go to Amazon, it's pretty easy to find. Create but space. create space. That's what it's called. So you can pick, like I'm, I like recycled paper. I like the matte finished covers. I like the perfect binding. So you can do all that at create space. Um, their interface is not as intuitive uh, as others I've used to upload things. But um, they, they are pretty good about working with you, getting you through the tech, technical problems if you have any. Um, but you can print a 115, 120-page book, uh, and it will cost you about $2.30 a copy. Now, that's, that's pretty... Yeah. That's for how, really for how good. many pages? Like 120 pages. Wow. Is it on, color? On recycled... No, this is black and white on okay. recycled paper with a heavy cover. Okay. Um, actually, Prism has some volume 11s in their stash in there of James World. If you want to check out the book, that was printed through Amazon. So, I know people... I have mixed feelings about Amazon, and I do too. Um, but I like the fact that the that they do print the books in the U.S., so they're using stateside printers. You know, like mine, mine, staying mine were printed in South Carolina. I mean, so I felt better about that because I mean, I think when you are a small publisher, you do sort of have to figure out ways to still make money on it. You know what I mean? Um, or at least break even. Like if it's yeah. something where you're like. One of the things that I've run into is that I can't provide um, print copies to outlets that want to review them, and they need to schedule their reviews well in advance, um, like months and months in advance, because you can. I, I could do a, a run like that where I'm printing a... You could. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. If yeah. you want to get a, a book that looks like it's a finished polished Sort of book. like it's going to look when it's offset. Yes, but it's yeah. really just to get it out there, to show it at shows, to maybe show it to publishers who might pick it up. It's a very, it's a more sort of professional package. Um, the reason I tried, decided to experiment with Amazon was because when you self-publish, this is the other thing you don't think about up front, you have to store all your books. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So when you got 11 volumes and you're stupid enough to print number 10 in hardcover, that... <laughs> you, you really can, don't like that. You can cover. ask my wife who says, if I have to carry a box of books one more time, you know, <laughs> from the garage to the house or from the garage to UPS. I mean, yeah. that's... That's the unglamorous How do you think I got these guns? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't need to go to the gym. I'm like hauling 30-pound books. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I don't know if that answers Lift with the legs. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of your books, gentlemen, what kind of, um, like, what kind of print runs? So what kind of print runs do you do? Just last question. What kind of print runs do you do in your books? Mine, mine are usually around 2,000. Mm -hmm. I don't do a ton. The, uh, although Diamond did this thing where... See, they used to have this really great equation, and mm -hmm. you kind of knew that you would get your first order from Diamond based on the preview orders, and you would know how many to print. So, say they ordered, they used to order when when they had when Borders was around, they would order say 300, 400 copies of an indie title. Then you know, okay, I'll print like three times that many, four times that many. You could kind of gauge. Mm -hmm. But then Diamond didn't want to hold inventory either. Yeah. Right? They moved all their inventory stuff to Mississippi, and they don't want to store a lot of your stuff. So they drive me crazy. They'll order 30 books at a time. So you have to order the rest of it. So I underprinted, like, at least three volumes, mm -hmm. which is bad because yeah. then and you have... And what kind of runs did you do? I, was doing, I did, like, a 1,000. Mm -hmm. So that means the price point of each book is higher because you're printing fewer of them. You and make then, less money. And then when you have to reprint them, it's a whole new print run. Mm -hmm. So... That's a really hard thing to gauge. You're probably better at it than I am, but just numbers, like what to print. You learned this in publishing school. <laughs> yeah. The one we didn't go to, yeah. This is publishing school 101. Yeah. yeah. Yes. 
Well, when you talk about print runs, again, I was lucky back in the day when I said the demand exceeded the supply. Mm -hmm. When we were doing underground comics, the absolute minimum we would print on anything was 10,000, wow. and usually sell out quickly. And in those days, we just kept reprinting to supply demand. Um, so even though the, the, the distribution system seemed kind of rickety in retrospect, it was actually quite efficient. And this was, a, again, a non-returnable system. So when we shipped those books, we never saw them again. Uh, we've kind of devolved to, uh, to Diamond. And those of you uh, who aren't of a sufficient age will not know that at one time Diamond had uh, 10 or 12 competitors and that was the golden age of comics distribution because you had really, really great regional distributors. Capital City was uh, was was amazing, and you had them in, I think, literally every part of the country. So they were highly competitive, and uh, they provided a, a thing called service. Uh, <laughs> what was that? You want to spell that? Yeah. <laughs> And, uh, and of course, now we're at a point where there's a monopoly and uh, it is what it is and they have the rules and like you said, if you don't meet the minimums, they won't carry you at all. So it's tough. Um, I respectfully disagree on the hardcover angle just because uh, Yeah, your, me, your books are better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I never minded uh, lugging books and uh, space was a consideration. When I started out, I worked out of an east side flat in the city and I... I, my attic was my storage, so we had, I was already in a second floor apartment, I had to walk up a third floor, each time carrying a carton of books, um, which was great for cardiovascular exercise, <laughs> not the most practical thing, but then I, uh, I bought a farm in central Wisconsin and it included a barn, and once I had a barn, space was never consideration, so... Um, Maybe if I had a barn, a hardcover yeah. thing wouldn't bother me as much. As a publisher, that sounds like, yeah. a, like a dream, like, oh my god, a it farm is. with a barn, oh my god. <laughs> Bar Farmers Barns are a lot more expensive in California. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's one reason I picked it, it was low overhead, yeah. Yeah. as a practical matter. Yeah. Um, so I gradually just carved out a room at a room as I needed an office. Yeah, well, I had another room, and eventually the entire barn was, was occupied, and then I had to build a warehouse. But it, it was over a period of 30 years, so it was, it was a growth. The print runs now, I mean, today, uh, Kitchen Sink Press ended in 1999, but three years ago I revived Kitchen Sink Books as an imprint of Dark Horse. An imprint means I no longer have to do the what I call <laughs> the, the, I, I do the creative part. We, my partner and I, design and uh, handle all the editorial, and then Dark Horse does what I technically call the shit work part. <laughs> um, they they do the uh, the marketing, the warehousing, the collecting the money, and so on, and and it's a partnership. So together we determine the print runs, and they're smaller now than I was accustomed to in the old days. So. Even a, a, a book by, say, a Harvey Kurtzman, a classic for people who like the old stuff, 3,000 might be a, a typical sale on something like that because, it, first of all, it is a $25, $30 hardcover, mm -hmm. but it's for the cognoscenti. We don't expect to, you know, teenagers to buy that book. You have to already know who it is. You want a handsome book in your library. We can make some money at 3,000 copies at that price point. And generally, your copies are going to be, a lot of them are going to be pre-sold, they're going to be through distributors, they're going to be spoken for. Yeah. And so you, don't, you don't have to worry about warehousing yeah. tons and tons of Because it's that little niche, that there's, a special, there's so many yeah. little special niches in the, in the comics world. Yeah, there's so many, I mean, we're kind of a, you know, mm -hmm. niches. It is. So it's, it's finding that niche and then, uh, and then servicing it. And unfortunately, Diamond is not the most efficient way. So I think you've got to augment it. And one thing, again, I would, I would suggest there are some retailers who will order direct. And you can even suggest a consignment arrangement where you say, look, can I send you, you know, 10, 20 copies, pay me when you sell them. It's a hassle for them, it's a hassle for you, but sometimes it's the only way to do it. Yeah. And especially if you live in a city where you know some retailers, absolutely do it. And don't limit it to comic shops. They're independent bookstores who would love to support local can, author. Can Adult I, shops, uh, I, Toys and Babeland, um, this is like that. If you're doing work that's uh, that's erotic, especially if it's if it's aimed at women, totally they want that work. Yeah, a lot of cartoonists, uh, of publishers like Koyama, Annie Koyama, and 
Tom Kaczynski, who's a Minneapolis-based publisher with Uncivilized Books. Uh, I think 2D Cloud, also in Minneapolis, they have all gotten in with Consortium. Mm-hmm. It's a distro, and it's it's art comics oriented. Yeah. But once Tom once Tom got that, once he landed them, and, uh, and Annie did too, they said it just made a huge difference mm-hmm. for them. Like you know, your books. Consortium like, turned us down. Did they? I was just going to say, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's quite the right thing, but it gets you like kind of in that network. You see the you see the books pre publication online already yeah. with the cover art, and um, and they both. Tom says he told me he's doesn't even consider himself a micro press publisher anymore. Like mm-hmm. he's more like a small press publisher yeah. with with their help. And Annie said it was a big boom a big for, for them. Yeah. I mean, having a a, a publisher. Or having a distributor yeah. that has good relationships, that has a good reputation, is carrying quality work. Yeah, with um, stores, regular. That's stores. really valuable. I mean, yeah. it, uh, and Diamond is not really that because they're such. Uh, they're the only game in town in a lot of ways for for large scale distribution. So they really have like what they carry really has no weight in terms of quality level because they pretty much carry anything that's high volume mainstream stuff, and then occasionally they'll carry some smaller. Do they carry stuff. everything that you? They carry everything we do. Actually, I mean, I, 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 uh, I have to give them kudos for carrying all the books we've ever published from I the beginning. I was gonna say I've never. They've always been. They've actually always been helpful to me. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. it's not. It, it. I don't make any money <laughs> with them selling with them. Um, the orders are not high enough to, um, to pay for the print runs by any stretch. Uh, and I always overprint by more of a factor of 10 than a factor of 4 because I know that I'm going to be warehousing them for a long time and selling them over time. Um, but, uh, but they, you know, I mean, they have minimums and they, you know, we've had some issues with resolicits and they still, I mean, like, they still let me relist the books if they're late or if they didn't have enough time. Um, so that's, I mean, so in, you, you can find people to work with. Like my first rep at Diamond got promoted and I love her. She actually is no longer my rep, but she, whenever... Uh, my rip goes out of town, she takes over, and then suddenly everything all happens for me. Um, but I think that she's still kind of behind the scenes pushing for me and helping me. So it's really helpful. I mean, make make friends everywhere and never be mean to anybody, ever, ever, ever. Um, yeah. Be kind as much as you can possibly be kind to everybody and do favors. If it's not going to be any money out of your pocket, do it, do it, do it. Um, because you never know who's going to be around. Uh, people remember the good stuff uh, they remember the bad stuff much more. So be nice all the time. Um, I want to ask, uh, since this is a queer comics conference and we haven't talked at all about queer stuff and publishing, I mean, I think maybe you, some of you will sympathize with this, but I feel like doing queer comics for me is an excuse just to do comics. Like, it's my, it's my umbrella that I work under in Northwest Press, but I really just love comics, and it's kind of my excuse to do comics. Like, I know the... Um, the Christian Comic Art Society, and uh, we met them at San Diego, and they're great friends with us. And I think that we, we're friends because we both have different excuses for wanting to do comics. And we don't hate each other, we just, we both love comics, and we both love talking about comics and doing comics. And so, um, but I wanna talk about niche markets. Uh, are there still, um, are there still, because the gay bookstores uh, are disappearing, if not already gone in most cases. Um, but the amount of queer comics is, seems to be rising, right? It's exploding. It's exploding. And so is this all direct sales? Um, what impact does the loss of the queer bookstore have on our ability to have a queer comics community? And what's taking the place? I mean, obviously, we have a queer comic community because here we are. Yeah. Um, but is it all conventions? Is it all events like this? Is it all nonprofits? Do you, do you know what I think a big part of it is? And, and I, I remember... Uh, with SPX that this last year, when Queer was nominated for Best Anthology, and, and it was up against Tony Millionaire, and um, I hate saying up against, like you know, they're, you know, they're they're cartoonists. You know, Tony Millionaire was also into consideration. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and and, and, and uh, these are really amazing cartoonists. Um, uh, God, what's his name? I mean, I mean, panel amnesia here. I mean, it was um, a it was a, a good lineup. Oh yeah, and and I just thought, well, you know, I'm so happy to be nominated. This is my second nomination actually for an anthology, and um, I was I was really happy. I didn't think you didn't anything, eat the pudding. I didn't think about winning <laughs> at all, and I I didn't actually get in the lottery, so I wasn't even there. But I won. You know, the the book won, and I'm so proud of that. And. Marina, we tweeted it to me, you know, she was there, and then I tweeted it to Zan, like, Zan, we, 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 we did it. Um, 
and, and looking back on it now, looking at the demographics, we totally, why wouldn't we win? There is such a younger generation coming. They're coming out of CCS mm -hmm. and, and the other one, the one that's in, that's in California. I get, the two, I get the Vermont one. They, they both have similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. CCS. Uh, and, last yeah. Night. Yeah. <laughs> um, the show has gotten so queer. There's all these people like Melanie Gilman and Sasha Steinberg and Laurel Lynn Leake and you know they're and they're just powerful voices out there and 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 yeah SPX has gotten amazingly queer when we did a queer panel I asked Robert Clough the last time I was at SPX not last year but the year before the year before that I asked him you know let's do a queer comics panel would you moderate he's like yeah totally and he's straight he's a, was a total he's a total ally of, uh, of ours like he loves what we're doing and, and he's great um and he's a white cisgendered male, so remember that, folks. Like, don't judge people too much. Um, but that that thing was packed, and the organizer of SPX, um, Bill, um, I can't remember his name, um, Cantanopoulos. Um, yeah, I think that's it. He said he could just feel the energy in the room. It was SRO. Yeah, and you you, you were yeah, it was too. Yeah, yeah, it was an awesome. It was really panel. great. Yeah, uh, it was and the last it's just getting better. Yeah. So I just think all these kids are are they're they're graduating and it's a different world and they can just be open and queer and they just say I'm a queer cartoonist. Even and if they're not though, what I find is people that, of that generation are just, they read good comics and I'm like, yeah. who's doing them? It's yeah. like, I like, I know so many people that are, that are not gay at all, not even in the, and then they'll, and I'll mention somebody that I think is only read by queer artists or whatever and they're like, Oh no, I love their stuff, yeah. and it's like so. I just don't think it matters if, if the quality of the materials there. They're more open to read just good comics, yeah. regardless of what the origin. I is. did an article for TCJ last, or well, it was published early this year, about last year. The comics Journal. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, one of my points in the thesis was, you know, uncivilized books published War of Streets and Houses by Sophie Yanow, Yanow, I guess, is, uh, and. Um, Fantagraphics published Massive, the big um, gay manga anthology. Um, Koyama Press did 100 Crushes by Alicia Lim. And, um, and Fanda is doing the Lovable Oaf book, um, which is just about coming out, or if it's not already, uh, already coming out. Um, and it's just, it's, those lines are blurring, and it's a really good thing, you know. So do you think, um, so it's kind of a double-edged sword with the loss of, like the loss of gay bookstores as, as specialty markets, um, on one hand, it means that a lot of the material that you used to only be able to find there is now available everywhere, mm -hmm. especially online. Mm -hmm. um, so that's positive in that it's not ghettoized. It's, uh, it has the potential to be seen and reach a much larger audience of uh, different types of people. The, the negative, of course, is that if that's specifically what you're after, um, then you might not get exposed to the whole universe of stuff because all you see is maybe the like you'll see an Alison Bechtel memoir uh, next to a bunch of other memoirs, but it's not in a section where you can browse a bunch of different queer stories. Um, and that's kind of why I think Prism has been such a good uh, entity at shows because what Prism will do is they take books on consignment from everybody, and then you, when you go and shop, you, you might find like a James World book that you like. And then you find a whole bunch of other great women uh, cartoonists talking about um, lesbian stuff, and you're like, oh, and you just buy them all. Uh, and those people, would, they, they don't, like if they're tabling by themselves in the middle of a show, it's the same kind of thing, where they're, how do you find them? How can you uh, can locate these people? Do you think that in the new world um, that kind of blogs and tumblers and um, reviewer reviewing sites uh, and kind of like affinity, like special interest uh, reviewers and sites do you think those people are the new kind of gatekeepers to connect people? Whereas distributors used to be the people, but now it's I, maybe the... Maybe it's just the circles I run in, because I run in, you know, like in the smaller, you know, the internet-based... Ink stained hands. Yeah, yeah, again, <laughs> I, it's again, it's my zine roots. I guess I, I like really connecting with other creators, yeah. and public, you know, and small press... Like, where can people publisher. go if they want to find... Like, like I want to read like gay um, slice of life stories. Like, oh, yeah. I want to just go to some place, either yeah. online or in person, and find them. Yeah, I mean, just what would be the first thing? Go to prison. Go to Northwest Press. Go There's to. There's an online gay comics directory. If anyone hasn't seen it, and it's just got. Hundreds Is that the of one that Mary Naomi? Oh, Ma Mari. Together? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mari's thing. Yeah, and she also has an. Uh, uh, people of color site too. It's just, it's just, it's real basic. She always, she talks about how she wants to grow it, but um, it's just it, it takes up a lot of time. But yeah. it's a good resource. So yeah. It's called the Queer Comics Directory. 
Um, yeah. It, uh, and there's sites like, um, yeah. uh, what's, oh, Gay Comics List, uh, that Francois does. Yeah, yeah, France. yeah. And, and he does he, really great reviews. Yeah, and he, and he, yeah, that's a good one. Um, Optical Sloth, is a, he likes disease, he does, he reviews anything, he's been really kind to me, and he's a straight, another straight white guy, and he, he loves the stuff we do, you know, he, he um, loves three, and he sequential loves... Sequential Tart is another good one, if you, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you want stuff that's queer and women's uh, mm -hmm. focused, mm -hmm. they do, they review lots and lots of stuff. Yeah. And, and Robert Clow's High Low blog, um, oh, and just, tum and explore Tumblr, really, I mean, it is... Mm -hmm. There's just vast amounts of queer creators on there. It's not yeah. just for porn. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> There's that. Well, we're getting down to the. This, I, this has gone by. We've already been here for an hour and a half. Oh, really? Can you believe that? Isn't that crazy? Um, um, I want to take some. By now, I, I want to take some questions because I'm sure we haven't hit on it. There's so much more to talk about. I, I knew that this was going to be easy because yeah. we all we all live this and we can talk about this forever. And I well, we'll keep talking about this after this panel is done. But. Um, are there any questions we we'll have in the audience uh, about like their own publishing work or any questions about what we do? Yes. I've heard some like sort of mixed perspectives about niche markets, whether like if there was the statement like anytime you're just trying to fill a niche, you won't feel authentic versus like trying to connect with other gay artists. Mm -hmm. Like Well, it's kinda of like what came first. Uh -huh. It's like the in one case you have a niche that you decide that you're gonna you're gonna address. Yeah. And the other you want to read that work and it doesn't exist, so you make it. And yeah, then it I goes think you there. have to differentiate between content and distribution, which is what you're talking. Huh. About. Like, like we were talking. It's not about a marketing two, issue when yeah, you're we were, talking about the creation of the work. Yeah, we were talking about two different things. When I'm okay. when I said that, I was talking about the content, because yeah. what you want to do is you people comics are a solitary art form. So mm -hmm. if I want to read your comic, it's because I want to connect with you and your viewpoint. You know what I mean? That's so it's like a novelist or anything else. So that's why I was saying, if you're thinking in your head, oh, I want to do a superhero that does you know X Y Z because nobody's done that. Well, yeah. that might seem false as opposed to saying mm -hmm. I want to do a, a comic about a woman who's just starting her career in New York and all the stuff mm -hmm. that happens to her. That's much more personal, much yeah. more real. That's that's what I meant when I well, said. Well, a good that. rule of thumb is. Um, yeah. If you're doing the kind of work that you want, mm -hmm. especially if it's work that you want that you can't get because yeah, it doesn't exist, other that's a really good do. sign. Okay. Um, that's how. I, that's why I started James Bond. Yeah. Really. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Yes. Um, if you're writing a graphic novel, um, would it make any sense to take the first chapter that's all done nice, mm -hmm. um, have it? put in a good form, like you were talking through Amazon or whatever. I also, I just want to mention, I think Barnes & Noble is doing this now too, uh, as far as making books. Like the small digital ones. Yeah, I, 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 I was shocked, I saw it. And my point is, would it, would it make any sense to do just that one chapter, try to get it around, considering it's going to take three or four more years to finish the rest of the book? Mm -hmm. Oh, to just to get your to get introduced to people. Yeah, like, this is coming. Yeah, yeah. sure. I've, I've just, done just, that. just wait another half that. a decade. Yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's easy. Coming well, soon. It's kind of it's you're Asterisk. you're essentially doing a floppy then. Like so, when I've done the Martian Confederacy with with my friend Jason who writes it, we usually if the book's not ready, we'll take the first twenty four pages and do a little floppy comic book. Yes, that we can take to shows and say yeah. it's coming. And well, having something done. It's such a good um, sign for people, like if or for a distributor, for a publisher, for anybody, for a reviewer. Um, it demonstrates that you can you can deliver, and delivering is everything. I mean, it, 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 you can have the greatest ideas and talk about them endlessly and pitch, 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 pitch. But if you can actually bring in a comic, like if you have a, a story you want to tell, you bring in the work that you've done and you show it to them. Oh, that, that, that holds true for like submitting for grants, mm -hmm. um, submit the most finished po work you possibly can because that's proving to the committee that's going to review it that it's not just an idea, you're following through on it and you're going to do it. Yeah, I don't want, I don't ever, ever want to meet another person who tells me they've got this great idea for this graphic novel. <laughs> show, you know, show me the money. Like, just kind of nod and smile. Yeah, and yeah because you know it, the chances, are, you, you don't know which way it's going to go. They, they may well come through with it and they may not. Yeah. It's really hard to, it's so much work and 
so many circumstances can you know circumvent that. Well, you can also do um, one thing we do with the John Macy books is uh, the Fearful Hunter series. He actually did those on his own as a self-published um, kind of an annual large format uh, issue. Uh, he did uh, four chapters. Um, we uh, he ran out of his print of uh, his uh, self-published print runs of those single issues, and we did the collection. We give away the first one as a digital book, uh, and it's like sixty-four pages long. It's huge, and we have all these extras in it and video, like trailers and things. Um, and we just give that away because it's kind of like a first one's free kid. Hey, hey, you know, um, and that that goes really, really well. That does really, really well because if you can, if your work is good. And it should be good because you should be doing good work. Um, then uh, people, when they get a taste of it, they'll they'll be hungry for more work. And so, give away a bit of it. Give away a bit, and 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 you can make it freely available. Do it online. Make it. It's free to, to give it away online. Yeah. I endorse that too. Take a lesson yeah. from the heroin dealers. <laughs> <laughs> First one's free. Yeah. You get them hooked. Yeah. yeah. Get them hooked, start them yeah, up. That's like yeah. the best advice I've heard about in this whole Treat it like heroin. Yeah, Treat it like heroin. <laughs> yes, in the back. Hey, uh, okay, kind of a two part distribution question. Okay. The first part's for Rob, and it's kind of like the micro part. Like when Dylan Williams was doing Spark Plug books before he died, he was kind of turning that into like almost a de facto small press distribution yeah. to get to comic stores yeah. specifically for like a lot of micro publishers and small things. Is anyone kind of doing that currently with like a one stop shop? Yeah, thing? John Porcelino is. Um, Steve, though, I, even though you know, I think your work is wonderful and stuff. Yeah. I don't think it's right. I don't know if John John P would. I love him, but I don't know if it, he could sell your work to his because he has a much more sedate, you know, readership. I, mean, you know, I love I love him and I love his work, but yeah. Um, that's I do something that I think like that. that. Yeah, you because can, uh, um, you because uh, you know the Northwest Press, even though it's a it's a theoretically a for profit operation, it's um, <laughs> <laughs> a trombone. But um, I I do kind of run it with the same spirit um, that I I had with Prism in that I want it to be a one stop shop. I want it to be a celebration. I want to do a show. So I actually supplement the work that we do with a lot of people who are doing self-published and small press stuff. Uh, and I'll just buy them outright because I consignment thing is wonderful, but I hate it, all the, the numbers. So I just buy lots of 10, 20 books at a time and just supplement my inventory with those. So I, I have been, I worked with, um, I work with, uh, oh, what is his name? I'm totally blanking. Tony Shenton. Um, yeah. For distribution to small stores, but that's I mean, it's it's not it's not targeted enough. Mm -hmm. I have been toying with the idea of doing on a larger scale, doing something like that um, to to distribute books, and even online to have it be like one place you can go and buy you know twenty different queer comics and stock your cart and have one shipping cost. Yeah, um, I think it would be I think it would be useful. It's just a matter of space. Like I don't have a farm yet. So, um, um, I actually, I have to tell my story about my storage space. I had a, a 10 by 20 um, public storage thing with a roll-up door. Very important for those pallets that they deliver because they can roll them yeah. right in. Like somebody should tell me that. Yeah. Um, but I recently moved and I, I, uh, I had this brilliant idea that I would move into a place with a garage. I would pay extra rent to keep the garage all myself and that's where all the books are now. It's full. And I'm going to publish more books. So I'm stuck. So I have to get another storage space. But um, um, that's the big issue with that. Like, I, if I had um, free reign to have a lot of space, then um, I would just do, I would, I, would, I would want to get every book. I would want to get every book. So if anybody has any, any ideas, everyone wants to start the distribution company, let us know. And the second part of your question. The second part was actually with Mike, the macro part. Okay. Actually, I think the, the uh, Dennis and, and I know you ran into problems with ink, not with consortium, mm -hmm. and the art book publishers, like these and small press, they they all have sort of a very specific distribution identity that mm -hmm. comics don't necessarily fit yeah. in. Ingram, can you go to Ingram or one of those book retailers sort of directly if you have more than 10 titles? Yes. I think both of the two of you. There's Baker and Taylor, and there's Ingram. Um, uh, and there's Bookazine. There I got rejected by Bookazine. I got rejected by Consortium. I got accepted by 
uh, I can't remember if it's Ingram or Baker and Taylor, but they they um, I'm always wary of somebody who's a who's a who's a middleman in a transaction who's taking a cut that also wants you to subscribe to a premium thing, and they offered me a premium package for seven hundred fifty dollars a year that included some ad space or something, and I'm like I. You know, if you're not confident that my books are going to sell with you, that you're telling me that with this, and that means that I'm not going to make any money with you anyway. I'm not going to move a volume of books. I really want a distributor that has returnability because I, I have a lot of faith in in our books, but there's not a lot out there that it's easy to get into. We used to be with Bookazine um, uh, when I was with Prism. They distributed the Prism Comics guides when we printed those, uh, and they would sell seven fifty a thousand copies at a time with Bookazine. But then our rep passed away, yeah. and then the replacement yeah. rep was absent. That was my experience too with yeah, them. Same with them. I had the same too. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I mean it's really tough. And, and and as it goes on, though, I start to think maybe I just want to bypass this all entirely because the direct uh, direct sales, convention sales, online digital sales, like that's all what I'm doing, and it, it's a significant amount of business. Um, and I have a, a site set up that's smooth and easy enough to to do that. That, like that's growing and the distribution is shrinking. So why am I so obsessed with the distribution? You know what I mean? I do. Do you, do you get pushback from independent bookstores there because they just they don't want to deal with five hundred publishers? They want yeah. to get an order from one place and get three or four titles in because they don't have space for inventory either. That's sort of an, on a basic transactional level. That's sort of. That's the bottom that they want the material. They don't want the hassle of dealing. They don't want five hundred different places to yeah. order books from. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it's a it's a struggle. Because I've worked in an independent bookstore for the past. I mean, before I became gay comics creator, I don't know if it's the greatest <laughs> detour of work. But um, anyway, I was working in an independent bookstore before I was doing comics and during it. Um, and I dealt with a lot of publishers, or you know, self publishers coming to us with that same. Question: You know, why can't we take books independently? I mean, they can't, you know, take from so many sources. Mm -hmm. So most bookstores will only order from several. Yeah. They'll do Ingram, Baker, and Taylor. Those are the top two in the country yeah. right? for a mainstream bookstore, mm -hmm. and even a lot of the smaller bookstores yeah. too. But the the thing is, even if you get your book listed with Ingram, a lot of people don't know this. You have to have it returnable. That's yeah. that's a real. Um, cut off for a lot of bookstores. Mm -hmm. If it's not listed as returnable mm -hmm. on Ingram or Baker and Taylor. A lot of bookstores just are not going to order. And I know we create space in a lot of places. They say, we'll get your book on in the room or on the paper and tail, hopefully. But they won't say that they'll make it. You know, it's not a guaranteed sale. Yeah, that's the one advantage with Diamond is that it's not returnable. So if you make a sale through Diamond, it's, it, it's set. You don't have to worry about it. But when we did, um, like the Prism Guides is the only experience I have to go on with a distributor with returnability. We only ever got maybe like a, a quarter or less of them returned. I mean that, and that was still significant, but it was it was fine because it was. I think the bookstores just want that option yeah. before they're gonna. Right. Uh, yeah. It's a it's a hassle for them to return. They don't want to return things, but if you if you have faith in your if you have faith in your work, like I, I don't think I've ever gotten a return ever, and I give people that option. Yes. Just design it so that it's something attractive. That people yeah, it's want. attractive for yeah. someone who's gonna order it. Then so, you know, it's a less of a risk for a bookstore to take. Steve, do you have yeah. any? Do you have distribution? Do you have any distribution for shirtlifter? Oh God, no. No. Uh, I mean, I, I've I've flirted with turnaround in Britain, but they're not. They don't. You need kind self publishers. They look at you a little bit like a scans. Like, what's wrong with you? That Why won't anybody publish you? you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, it, it, it's not even about the content. It's it's sort of like nominating yourself for a award. Like it's inherently a suspicious activity. Even <laughs> in, 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 in the criteria. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Bookazine went under. Uh, the gate prerogatives was doing comic stuff for a while, and then they. I haven't of, heard from them in a while. Yeah. I know that still exists. Right. Um, I had this. In, in all my free time, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to. I have a list of all the stores that I've sold to that I have on my mailing list, and I, I want to contact all of them, have that introduction and, and personal, uh, you know, interaction with them, and ask them what distributors they work with, and figure out like, you know, if I had my books through Ingram or through Baker and Taylor, would you be able to order them? Just to make, just to see what I would be in for if I pushed and got distribution. 
Um, Because I know that's not the end of it, but you still have to advertise. You still have to let the stores know that they can go to that catalog and look for your book because they're not going to just, it's not going to pop out like a, like a, the catalog. Um, But yeah. Honestly, Amazon, Amazon is the majority of my sales these days. Amazon internet and direct retail sales. I just moved all my books into Amazon Prime and I've I've seen an uptick in the sales, but it's, I'm not thinking it might be a wash, but it's, it's pretty, it has a little. Little blue prime for it next to my book. Can I say one real quick thing? Yes. One thing, um, is, again, people like Annie Kayama or Tom Kazins, really the Minneapolis publishers I know, but um, they have really gotten into getting interns. And I was just wondering if, and have you guys ever looked at, Sam, you need an intern. I had an yesterday. intern, um, yeah. uh, Ashley Guillory, who I love. She's so yeah. great. She does uh, One Direction comics. Mm-hmm. She made a Team Bun t shirt for one of the, I don't know if all well, you kids are listening to these days, but. Um, she was great. She did like a this week in queer comics thing with me, a little cartoon every um, every week that would have like a what was happening with Northwest Press and conventions and stuff. Um, and she would do some shows, and she would, you know. And it, it, I I I see it as it's our responsibility to give perks, to give information and education, yeah. to like um, let her meet all the people and do all this stuff. It would stuff. be a symbiotic relationship. Um, I mean, it's difficult because a, a lot of our business, I think, a lot of all of our business is uh, is so national and so international now that. People have written to me and said, I want to be your intern, but they live in Minneapolis or they live in Nebraska or they live somewhere else. And it's, I don't really know what to say to that. You know, um, I, I am to the point where I, I'm starting to investigate how to, to, to delegate a lot of this stuff and to yeah. like pay somebody, say, I'm going to fly you to the show and give you a hotel room and you're going to be the rep and you're going to sell these books. I'm going to give you a commission on those sales. Yeah. So I don't have to do it. Yeah, because Tom only, does that. I'm only one person. He's happy doing that. Yeah. It really helps. I mean, I love the shows. I love the shows. But I mean, I can't do 30 shows yeah. myself. So. Um, you know what? We're, we're, we're out of time. Yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, I, I have somebody. I have somebody. I have to drive to Toronto. Who does all my uh, social media stuff for me. Oh, that's great. I, you I just can't do it, do it all. No, no. <laughs> so you're drawing. Um, everybody, I want to thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, thank you. This has been so great. Um, We'll be, some of us will be around the rest of the show, and some of us will be in, on the car, in the car, going to Toronto. But yeah. thanks for, for, thank you guys for being here. Thank I had a fun time. It was awesome.